Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sean Casey. I am the director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs here at Georgetown University. It's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to what I think is going to be a fascinating discussion, and uh, we're, we're pleased that you, you could join us. Many of today's international crises have a strong religious component, yet media coverage often omits or oversimplifies these complexities and nuances. The Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs at Georgetown believes that a deep examination of faith and values is central and critical to address today's global challenges, and that open engagement of religious and cultural traditions with one another can promote peace. With this mission in mind, the center has partnered with the Pulitzer Center for Crisis on Crisis Reporting to offer a student fellowship and other initiatives that support journalism that investigates or illuminates the religious dimension on an international issue, bringing to light what is often overlooked, untold, or misunderstood. So applications for this year's student fellowship are open through February 15th, uh, and we have flyers and more information which can be found on the small table immediately straight outside through the doors in the back. So if you're a student and you're interested in that, please pick up a sheet there and you will find some fascinating information. I'm also uh, happy to introduce or welcome Ann Peters, who is the University and Community Outreach Director uh, at the Pulitzer Center, and she manages the campus consortium of which the Berkeley Center is a member. So welcome. It's great to see you again, Ann. In addition to student opportunities, uh, Berkeley partners with the Pulitzer Center to offer public dialogues that bring together scholars to discuss public, uh, I'm sorry, to discuss complex and pressing global issues. And today's dialogue brings together Photographer George Steinmetz, who contributed stunning aerial photography to the Pulitzer's Losing Earth Project, and also American University's Professor Evan Berry, a good friend of the Berkeley Center, whose research focuses on ways in which religious ideas and organizations are mobilized in response to climate change and other global environmental challenges. Moderating our discussion will be Pulitzer Center Executive Editor Indira Lakshmashan, um, Lakshman, I'm sorry, who possesses 25 years of experience as a foreign correspondent, State Department correspondent, a, a very hard beat to cover, as I know personally, uh, a national political correspondent, columnist, and host reporting from 80 countries and from Washington for the Boston Globe, Bloomberg, the International New York Times, NPR, and others. We invite you to join us for a reception immediately afterward uh, in the President's Room to your right as you exit which features a number of Steinmetz's aerial photography prints just outside here of Riggs. So again, thank you all for coming. Look forward to a great discussion and dialogue. And now I'd like to invite George to the podium to, to kick off our event. Um, I'd like to share with you some pictures I took uh, on assignment for the New York Times Magazine. And they asked me to illustrate a story by Nathaniel Rich about how we lost um, kind of a golden opportunity to uh, prevent the effects of climate change some 30 years ago. And they wanted me to look at the ramifications of those decisions or non-decisions that we, uh, from times past. And so I, they asked me to find the strongest examples of climate change on every continent. And I had about a year to do it. And uh, my first, uh, the first place I went was, uh, was Greenland, and this is on the western side of the Greenland ice sheet, and uh, most people when they think of glaciers melting, they think of big chunks falling off into the sea, but the reality is about 60% of the ice loss is actually from glaciers melting in, in situ, and this is uh, typical of the Greenland ice sheet. In the summer, we have large glacial lakes, and you see the, the stream leading into it, and a lot of these, these lakes will drain right down through uh, through to the, the, the base of the glacier, almost a mile down, and they will lubricate the base if it actually speeds it on its way to the sea. And I went with some scientists from the National Science Foundation who were studying the, the flow of the, uh, of the glacial melt, and they put red dye in the water to track it as it went down a big moulin, which is a, drain, a big drain hole, like a, a mile long drain hole that goes down to the base of the glacier. They were trying to see how fast and the, the nature of the drainage. Um, and most of my work was looking at uh, the effects of climate change, but while I was in China, I wanted to look at a couple of the causes. And I'm not saying the Chinese are the sole cause of climate change, but they do have the largest uh, coal mine in Asia. And China is the biggest um, contributor to greenhouse gases. Uh, this is called, mine called Herwusu. Um, it's in Inner Mongolia. And uh, most, of these, most of the pictures I took in this project are worth the drone. It's very difficult to get um, permission to photograph inside a mine like that with the drone. 
Um, you don't really need permission. Um, this is uh, one of the coal sorting yards outside the largest power plant in China. It, it supplies about um, a third of the energy uh, for Beijing, and they have a coal sorting yard where they take all the, the coal from different mines and decide how the, the different grades they're going to put into the power plant. Uh, an overview of Shanghai. Uh, one of the bigger biggest issues in China is that is, is the people have more money. They're spending um, they're spending more. Uh, they're buying more devices that require electricity, and they're buying more cars. They still have a small fraction of the amount of um, vehicle and electricity use we have here in the United States. But the rate of increase there is, is extraordinary, and it's what's driving uh, the increase in fossil fuel production. Sorry, fossil fuel emissions. Um, in China, they have a big problem with, um, uh, with, with fresh water. There's a lack of fresh water, and the biggest freshwater lake, Lake, lake Tai or Lake Taihu, um, is now in the summer, it's mired with algal blooms, and those are caused by warming water uh, from climate change as well as agricultural runoff, which uh, um, provides uh, basically fuel for the algae. Um, here, it's, they're mired in, in, a, in a fish trap on the shore of the lake. Um, and this is an aerial view of, of Dhaka, the main ferry terminal in Dhaka. And uh, Dhaka, uh, with climate change, is getting flooded almost every year. It's, um, as it subsides, it's, uh, some of the, the streets become almost like the inside of a, of a bathtub. And this is, you're looking down the, uh, the wall uh, on the edge of the river. And they have a, a lot of uh, issues with, with poor planning and, and, and extreme uh, Flood water flooding is caused by um, the warming of the water in the Bay of Bengal, which increases the, the moisture content. It all comes in as uh, monsoonal rains. Here, it's flooding out uh, fish traps, and fish fish farms, and rice paddies. And when you upriver in the Brahmaputra, it, it uh, breaks its banks almost every year. And the people who live inside the the delta have just it's become almost an annual occurrence that they have to abandon their homes and then come back and. and um, and clean the mud out and plant their crops again. Uh, this is the last island on the edge of the Brahmaputra Delta. And the, the green you see in the background, those are rice paddies. And so it's, to me, the, these people, it's kind of like you're, you're in a flood zone, but the, the water's like almost right up to their nose. I mean, if it, if it goes a couple inches higher, they're going to lose their, their rice crop. But this is at high tide, and the, the ferry terminal is underwater, so they have to wade through the water to take a boat back to the mainland. The people there have learned how to, they've, they've adapted, but they learned how to live very lightly in the land. And so when you want to get to one part of the island to the other, they have this, this very rickety bamboo bridge to get across. And uh, when you, it, it's, a, it's a very uh, prudent adaptation to an area where you just know you're going to get hammered every year or flooded every year. Um, I spent about three weeks to go to Antarctica. I wanted to go and uh, visit a penguin colony there. The penguin populations in Antarctica are declining, especially chinstrap penguins. And they're declining due to loss of their principal food, which is krill. The krill live off algae that grows in the bottom of sea ice. With warming water, there's less sea ice, therefore less algae and less krill. And the penguin populations have declined about 50% in the past, over the past 20 years. It's the shore of De uh, Deception Island where the penguin colony is, is, a, is a small fraction of what it, it was. Um, you also find uh, severe effects of climate change in West Africa. This is in Mauritania. It's the ancient town of Chingeti. It was a caravan stop for the salt trade uh, many, uh, many centuries ago. But it's slowly becoming buried in sand as uh, desertification and, and increasing, um, I increasing intensity of sandstorms uh, buries it. I talked to the chief of the village, and they said that, he have, that they have an average now about a meter of sand coming in every decade and, and burying the town and knocking the, the village walls over. And sand is also a problem in the capital of Nouakchott. Um, when Nouakchott was established back in the, uh, 1962, there were only about uh, two dozen people living in what's now the capital. Now they're over a million. And they're slowly becoming buried in sand there, too, by these um, encroaching sandstorms. If you look in the lower right part of this photo, you can see the, the water truck. They have no um, uh, electricity or, or running water in, in the suburbs of Nouakchott. Um, last year was actually a pretty good year for the Great Barrier Reef, but the seagrass was not so lucky. And this is um, on the southwest coast of Australia in Shark Bay, where I went out with some scientists who were uh, trying to figure out how to reestablish seagrass, which was dying due to um, in increasing water temperatures. And um, this is in the, the Gadmen part of, uh, of Switzerland. 
They estimate by the end of this century there will be almost no permanent ice left in the Swiss Alps. And uh, this bridge crosses an area that only 20 years ago you could walk across the ice to get from one side of the valley to the other, and now they have the longest footbridge in Switzerland to get across. Um, I was in Africa when uh, Hurricane Harvey struck, and I got on the next plane and got, I was in, actually able to get into Houston on the first helicopter, uh, the first say, civilian helicopter allowed in the airspace. And this is a um, uh, view of suburban, uh, suburban Houston. They had an, a year's worth of rainfall fall in four days from Hurricane Harvey. And increasing water temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico are leading to increasingly intensive rainstorms. Uh, this is Beaumont, Texas. They had um, 18 inches of rain in 18 hours. And it wasn't, most of the floods you think of as like, you know, big walls of water coming in here. It was just like somebody left the shower on for 18 hours and just nowhere for the water to go. And uh, this is in the coffee park, coffee park section of Napa, California, where wildfires uh, caused uh, by uh, climate change wiped out an entire suburban community. Um, the prolonged drought in California had, had killed off a lot of uh, parts of, a lot of, lit a lot of dead um, tree branches, and severe winds knocked the tree branches into power lines, fell on the grass, and you had a very intensive wildfire. And this is, uh, I, one of the wonderful things about working with a drone is you're actually there on the ground, and as I walked through uh, Coffee Park, it was the, the weirdest thing I saw were, the, were, were vehicles like this one, where you could see pools, where you could see streams of, of aluminum from the melted uh, wheel hubs going down the streets. So that's my short global tour of climate change. Now I'd like to invite uh, Evan and Adira up on the stage. So a quick word of thanks to my colleagues on stage today and to our hosts at the Berkeley Center for having us to, to have this conversation. So thank you, Sean, for, for getting this together. Um, I wanted to say a few things about uh, the broader set of connections between religion and climate change, maybe to seed some conversation for us uh, and, and, and a little while to, to bring you in as well. So one thing that journalism and religion have in common is that they're both ways of telling stories about how different groups of people experience what's going on in their places. And that storytelling element is really uh, an important aspect and something that I'm really grateful uh, for George's photographs for doing. Right? They tell us, uh, as, as the saying goes, much more than just 1,000 words a piece. So we have quite a lot, I think, to work with today. Uh, one of the, the, the challenges, I think, of telling stories about climate change is that we tend to talk about it like it's one thing. Like there is a thing called climate change and that it is being experienced all over the world in somehow the same way. And I think the images today help us, help us rem remember that it's actually not one thing at all. It's lots and lots of different things. In some places that means hot. In some places that means wet. In other places that means dry. In some places that means fire. Right? There's really different kinds of outcomes for the ways that communities will experience climate change. And journalism is a really important tool uh, for telling us and reminding us about what that looks like and what that feels like and how, how communities are experiencing those impacts. Another place, this is a place where I think uh, the power of religion is really important too. What we call climate change, we sort of use this policy language of climate change being uh, a set of scientific observations about macro scale changes in the planetary environment is something that we need to create policy infrastructures to regulate the, the global economic system and think about carbon emissions and so forth and so on. That's essentially one story at the aggregate scale that we think about. And maybe religion has a role to play there. I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. But another set of stories is that the people who live in the particular places where the, where, where the impacts of climate change are being felt uh, experience those stories and uh, experience those changes and draw on their own stories in different ways to n narrate and navigate them. For instance, uh, I have a colleague whose work is in the headwaters of the Ganges River, which is a really important uh, pilgrimage site in, in India. And over the last five to ten years, there have been a series of terrible floods in that part of the world, which are increasingly seen as the gods getting angrier, right? That the Ganga River is no longer a friendly goddess and a mother goddess, but in fact someone uh, who needs uh, 
to, to repay us for our sins, right? So there's a karmic retribution there. So the kind of religious change is helping people understand the environmental changes in their, in their communities and in their parts of the world. But religion is a, is, a, is a tool people use sort of in addition to what we get from science and from journalism. So I wanted to um, point to a couple of particular images as places where I think we can make some in, in interesting connections uh, between uh, religion and climate change. So here we see uh, downtown Houston in the background. And as many of you know, Houston is not only the capital of the fossil fuel industry in the United States, it's a huge refining and extraction city, it's a shipping port for fossil fuels. It's also in some ways uh, sort of the headquarters of evangelical Christianity in the United States. Um, it's an important site in American Christianity. And in American Christianity, there are really live and um, fraught debates about how to respond uh, to climate change. Many of you might have been familiar with stories uh, from the newspaper about um, the tendency of many evangelical Christians in the United States to deny climate change. But at the same time, there are also those uh, in the Christian community who are talking about the signs and wonders evident in dramatic environmental events like this that tell us about the coming of the end times. There are many uh, people in the evangelical community who see pictures like this in Beaumont and uh, want us to remember the least of these and to think about the kinds of uh, resources for social justice evident in the Christian theological tradition. Right? So those, those are active and ongoing debates that people are bringing to bear on how they vote and how they think about this really important uh, public policy issue. I also wanted to back up and look uh, at Mauritania as well. Um, this picture uh, is one of several places in North Africa and the Middle East where uh, climate change is being ex uh, experienced through the expansion of deserts, the desertification and the corruption of agricultural lands. And this is uh, a really important driver of conflict in the region. There's really good um, sort of social scientific evidence that the conflict in Syria over the last five years has been exacerbated by uh, a, a drought and that this um, the, 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 what we think of as environmental impacts often have ramifications in terms of social, political, and religious conflict, right? So I wanna think about the connection here between environmental change and what gets treated often in the media as religious strife. Let's look to uh, at uh, Bangladesh. So Bangladesh is one of a number of places in the world where we anticipate that the flow of refugees seeking, actually they're not technically refugees because people displaced by environmental change are not covered under the Geneva Conventions. Uh, however, uh, we expect that the flow of migrants from places like Bangladesh and other major river delta regions uh, as they flood uh, will grow. And uh, I wanted to underscore the importance of faith-based organizations in the humanitarian relief work that's related to that kind of uh, migration crisis. And then lastly, I wanted quickly to point uh, to this photograph of uh, Shanghai as a way to think about how we, we might imagine some other stories about the connection between religion and the environment. Uh, we know that the Chinese in aggregate are the world's largest contributors to climate change, but on a per capita basis, they're much less bad than uh, the Americans or the Saudis or the Canadians or the Australians. Those are the, those are the four real culprits here. Uh, but in China, um, there is a concept being promoted by the government called ecological civilization. And the idea is that uh, Chinese cultural traditions provide a set of novel resources uh, to rethink what our planetary future might look like. So that rather than thinking about the kinds of uh, resources and ideas that we, we share in uh, North America and Europe around how to respond to this, that in fact uh, we should pay more credence to cultural differences as a way uh, to create new kinds of cities and new models for the future. So that's drawing on, on Chinese traditions in some interesting ways. So I just thought I would leave it there as maybe things we could return to, and thanks again to my colleagues. All right. Um, well, thank you to both of you for participating in this, and um, we at the Pulitzer Center are so pleased to have partnered with you, George, and your writing partner, Nathaniel Rich, um, and sponsored this project that was in the New York Times Magazine. For those of you who haven't seen it, it ran in early August um, in the New York Times Magazine. It was an entirely black cover that just had a few words in white um, on the front to the effect of 30 years ago we could have stopped climate change. And the entire issue was devoted to this one article with George's photos and Nathaniel Rich's story. I highly recommend it. If you don't have a copy, it's all online. 
So, um, so we're happy to be here as the Pulitzer Center because our mission is to engage people in all of these global issues that affect our lives and often get you know kicked by the wayside and ignored when we're so focused on other things like the government shutdown. So I want to ask you, Evan, because of your background, um, you know, you, you've given us some thought-provoking ideas about people's reaction to climate change based on their own religious faith or cultural background. But I want to know whether, you know, across all these various countries you mentioned that George has photographed, do you see religion as an obstacle to actually solving climate change? Because when you say that people, some evangelicals, see it as a sign of the end times, that doesn't necessarily mean that they want to do something about it. Is it an obstacle to solving the problem, or is it a necessary part of trying to solve the problem by getting people on board through their religious beliefs? I think it's both. Maybe that's a, an easy answer. Uh, I think a lot of the journalistic cover, uh, coverage of, of that intersection here in the United States tends to focus on the ways in which religion might be an obstacle, uh, in large part because the politics around climate change in the United States are really hung up on a small percentage of the population that uh, rejects the, the scientific consensus on climate change. A small but powerful. A small but politically influential uh, minority of, of Americans who, who have those views. But outside the United States and, and globally, uh, it's a pretty different landscape. So that particular relationship between Christian belief and climate politics doesn't hold particularly powerful in any other country in the world. And in fact, in a number of places, and predominantly in Catholic countries, uh, you, you see large uh, you see trends to support the, the Pope's view on climate change. Uh, so there's this idea that, in fact, religion and ethics uh, derived from Catholic social teaching uh, can be a resource for the way we combat uh, climate change. And yet we in the United States are still the biggest, I think, per capita contributor to climate change. So when our president pulls us out of the Paris Climate Accord, um, whether or not he's influenced by that small but influential minority of people who you mentioned, they definitely have an outsized effect. They do, uh, although one thing I will say that might be a strange silver lining to the American withdrawal uh, from the Paris Agreement, or the proposed withdrawal, uh, is that maybe the, uh, the agreement looks a little bit more ambitious if you don't have America as a part of it. It's actually, uh, there are a number of European nations who think that um, commitments to social justice, commitments to adaptation funding, uh, and some of the, the, the dimensions of the global policy conversation that the Americans uh, tended to, to resist might move forward uh, with a little bit more vigor if we are not at the negotiating table to keep, uh, should we say, to hold, back, hold back. To hold back. Okay, well, I don't want to go too far down yeah, the track sure. on a debate over the Paris Accord, but the fact remains, if we're not in it, it's a lot harder to reach that reducing the growth in temperature by one to two degrees. That yes. now the latest reports that have come out from the UN and other organizations just in the last couple of months indicate that we have something like 10 to 15 years or global disaster will overtake us if we don't actually meet those targets. So I want to go back to the question of if in some places religion is an obstacle, how can religion be harnessed to try to get to the solution we need? I think therein lies the rub. I think there is a tendency in this conversation to want to think that religion is a thing that can be harnessed in the public policy conversation. Mm -hmm. And what I would submit for our collective discussion is that maybe it's not something that just exists that we can link up to other kinds of conversations, but is in fact um, a more dynamic and less predictable dimension of how we respond uh, to public issues. Mm -hmm. So in the United States, we have one set of those responses, and in other countries, it's, it's quite different. You find um, movements where uh, a desire to live simply uh, is in itself People are looking back in, in a variety of social movements that are playing out in Europe right now to traditions of simplicity and hard work and sort of the Protestant ethic as a way to think about what societies might look like in a low carbon future, right? That we simply need uh, warm clothes and decent medical care and we don't need cars or third bedrooms in our houses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That in fact, those kinds of austere uh, 
ethical outcomes have a resource in Christian tradition. All right, but for that to work, yeah. everyone has to buy into it. So that's a whole other argument. Agreed. George, I know your perspective on this as a photographer is not coming at it looking at religion and climate change connecting specifically, but you have thought, I know, about ethics and climate change. And from an ethical point of view, a lot of the arguments that we hear about climate change tend to focus on blame and you know duties and criticism of China and India, for example, um, for you know developing and industrializing now when we now know how damaging it was um, to industrialize in the way that we did and Great Britain did and all of Western Europe did. What is your reaction when you've gone around the world and photographed the impacts of climate change? How do you sort of internalize those arguments that you hear about the first world criticizing developing countries who are now trying to make the advances that we made 100, 150 years ago? Well, I, I think we all have to re reduce our consumption of resources. I mean, it's the, the classic argument, it's called the tragedy of the commons, and we're all taking, we're taking a lot more than the earth can, can, can put forth. And, and so um, I, I think it's not fair to blame the Chinese for trying to have a, a lifestyle that we have in the United States. It just doesn't work. So. I think we all have to look at what we can do individually to, uh, to try to reduce that. And, and, uh, and the, to me, the, lo more lo the logical system is to set up you know, kind of quotas and how can, can nations meet their, their quota. But where those numbers lie is a very tricky political thing to ascertain. I had a very strange experience and fascinating experience as a State Department correspondent for Bloomberg when I was once um, the pool reporter for a tour with Hillary Clinton um, and the environment minister of India. And the Indian environmental minister's team accidentally left me in the room um, during the climate negotiations because they thought I was part of Hillary Clinton's uh, negotiating team. And uh, so they shut the door and suddenly I was inside a climate negotiation. And it was fascinating to hear that what was said behind closed doors um, actually was pretty much the same thing that was being said in public, um, which was that Hillary Clinton said, uh, you know, we don't want you to make the same mistakes that we made, India, and we are willing to give you technology and all sorts of green tech that is gonna help you develop and grow and give everything that you need for your people without making the same dirty mistakes that we made and that we now regret. And the Indian environment minister turned to her and said, you're a hypocrite nice lady, but a hypocrite, because you know we, we want to develop just like your people did, and we need to provide livelihoods for our people. And so that argument plays out again and again and again. Every time the United States tries to make that argument, developing nations say, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So when you went around, what was the response that you got from, say, Brazilians who were being criticized for clear cutting the Amazon? Did they say to you, well, you guys plowed the Great Plains? Or you know, what, what was the response you got? And was some of that sort of you were seen as an American coming in and, and trying to dictate, oh, look, look at this terrible thing that's happening with climate change, and it's your fault? Well, you would hear that argument if you went up like into the Amazon. You would hear that, like, you know, we have every right to do. You know, you, 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 you plowed your, your prairies and killed your buffalo. Why can't we, you know, clear cut the forest and sell the logs and put in cattle? But it's also, when you go to Sao Paulo, you see urban people who are as disconnected from the natural world as, as people are in New York City. They're their little urban life and they have their, you know, electric vehicle and they're a kind of echo. And they kind of turn a blind eye to what's going on up country. So Brazil's unusual that you have, you kind of have both worlds in one, in, in one, under one government. Um, but right now, the, um, the, the, the the, the, the new political will there is to, is to go and exploit the resources. And it's so what's our moral obligation as Americans who did benefit from industrialization, regardless of our religions, um, which are many, what is our moral obligation as a nation to help people in countries that are developing now and that are feeling the effects? And as you say, there is this problem of the poverty of the commons and the global impact from, from industrialization. I think a moral imperative is not to impose our will on others, it's to try and clean up our own act and, and try to see what we can do in the United States to reduce our, our carbon footprint and what we can do to, you know, whether you want to go on. I tell you, I'm not trying to sell Priuses, but I think we need to figure <laughs> what we can do. And it's not just in energy consumption, it's, it, it's uh, it curious, I've been working on a long-term project about the global food supply 
And if you eat, you know, if you eat steak, you're, they're at like six units, of, six units of, of six calorie units going into that cow for every unit you get out. And so that's not really, uh, it's not really sustainable. And we have to think about all levels of consumption. So Evan, I'm not saying we have to live in a in a little log cabin somewhere with an axe, but we have to find out what we can do ourselves, every one of us. All right, so Evan, then, that ties back to the whole question of whether there are certain kinds of journalism. I mean, this project, I don't know what George's project is, but it sounds very interesting. Um, what sort of journalism in the form of either print or video, pictures, television, whatever, would be useful in sort of telling the story of climate change in a way that everyone of all religions could relate to and understand what the impacts are and the dangers? Just to quickly touch on this point, I think that there's a set of conversations about what we ought to do in response to climate change that have to do with lowering our emissions. Mm -hmm. And there's also a set of conversations about what we ought to do that are related to helping communities adapt to rapidly changing environments mm -hmm. and to be able to sustain themselves. Right? So one of these is about cutting our carbon emissions and one is about funding adaptation efforts. So around that first, I think you're absolutely right that it's important to clean up our own act. But I also think it's really important uh, that uh, wealthy and developed nations uh, be willing to, to share some of the resources that they've accumulated over time because of the benefits of fossil fuel development. Uh, and in that regard, I think it's really important for people, especially in the United States, to see the suffering of uh, communities in uh, parts of the world that are most dramatically being impacted uh, by climate change so that we can build the political will to, uh, to, to, to cultivate empathy and that those kinds of stories are, are of the utmost urgency. Well, you can draw the line between images of Houston and Hurricane Harvey, images of the wildfires in California and climate change, but that still doesn't make it all the way to Capitol Hill and 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. So I think we have been exposed to those images, even more than we've been exposed to Georgia's incredible photography of all around the world. I think every newspaper in America and every nightly newscast carried pictures of Hurricane Harvey and the, and the California wildfires. So why does that then not lead to action? What's missing? Well, uh, no comment about why those kinds of stories don't reach inside the walls of 1600 Pennsylvania <laughs> Avenue, but perhaps a word or two or about Congress. why Nothing Congress has been uh, less than effective. I think that largely has to do with the outsized role that fossil fuel corporations play in the American political landscape. We're not going to be able to have a realistic or meaningful debate if uh, large swaths of Congress require support from institutional Cap uh, fossil fuel money in order to get elected to office. It affects academia as well, of course, because a lot of universities are also get, get funding from the fossil fuel industry, and that has prompted yeah. a movement on campuses um, like today's uh, South Africa divestment you know, that yeah. we saw in the 80s is now fossil fuel divestment. And do you see it affecting sort of open debate and conversation on university campuses? Yeah, so the divestment movement is a nationwide campaign by students in many of America's universities to try to get their, their boards of directors to divest from fossil fuel holdings. Um, they've had some notable successes, but for the most part, um, those their, their message has been met with ambivalence by universities as, as institutions. Uh, the place where it has actually maybe impacted freedom of speech on college campuses, um, the Koch brothers um, have several shell organizations and have uh, set up centers at a variety of universities around the country. Uh, for instance, at Wake Forest, where I have colleagues. Um, I know the Pulitzer Center has done some work with folks at Wake Forest. And there's a center there for human flourishing. Uh, it's funded by the Koch uh, brothers. And that center is sort of bringing speakers and raising awareness about what the good life means um, and I can imagine uh, a picture of the good life as it is rendered by uh, folks who have um, a lot of money sunk into the coal industry and a very different picture being drawn by people uh, whose livelihoods have been actually affected by the coal industry. So yes, I think it is affecting our ability to have free and open conversations about this issue. Can you tell us whether it's affected Georgetown or American University? I wouldn't be able to speak for here at Georgetown. The interesting tension at American University is that the there's a lot of energy in our administration around going to a carbon neutral mm -hmm. uh, footprint and in greening campus and in sustainability efforts. And we've done a lot of amazing work. A lot of that has been student led. A lot of that has been 
done at the at the behest of our um, progressive administration. Um, but a for former, some, a former senior Obama administration official, a former secretary of HHS and OMB, um, is now the president of America University. Correct. So pr President Burwell has done great work on this, and and President Kerwin before her. Um, however, uh, the question about divestment. Uh, keeps running up against the cold hard facts that it has a board of directors uh, who is ultimately interested in the bottom line. Hmm. Um, I want to go back to the question I was asking originally though, which is whether there are certain kinds of coverage, photography or writing, that um, actually could move forward the debate in a meaningful way for the general public, not just for a sort of subsector like us in this room who care about climate change and are thinking about it and talking about it all the time. I know that the images from Bangladesh um, and various climate crises like that, flooding have activated people in the humanitarian community. And they have sort of been the spark for donations and refugee work. I know that Hurricane Harvey specifically opened up these fissures you've described within the American evangelical movement. Um, but what kind of journalism would really take us from sort of awareness by some people and be transformative, push this issue further? Yeah. I'm uh, not an expert in communications or a journalist myself, but I'm a big believer in documentary film. I think it's a really important and powerful tool, both long and short uh, documentaries. They're great teaching resources. They're great ways to get into elementary and high school level classes. I think they can tell stories in a way um, that isn't merely just images but also helps people sympathize with characters who come to life uh, for us. And I think this issue of the human, uh, the human stories and the human lives that are affected by climate change is something that's really important. Yeah, I, I recently saw the latest installment of um, Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth, his latest sequel to that um, on an airplane and was really moved by it. But I also sort of wondered to what extent is that kind of film preaching to the choir, that anyone who chooses that on their United Airlines button you know, is someone who wants to be open to that. Um, so I wonder whether you know, there are ways that we could be getting this content to everybody. And we know that cable news is the way that the greatest number of Americans still get their news. Um, George, since we have the benefit of having you up here in this intimate setting, I'd love for you to share some stories about the process of what you did and how hard it was and challenging in certain cases. You know, what you've shown us here is mostly aerial photography using drones, but I know some things you had to actually get up, get dirty, literally getting into places like Chinese coal mines and being married to a photojournalist myself who got thrown out of a Chinese coal mine and had all his film seized or his digital pictures seized, um, I can imagine that was very challenging. I'd love to hear your story about what happened in the coal mine and how you got those wonderful images. Um, here, here, let me see if I can find them. Um, I was about two miles away when I took this picture. Oh, wow. Um, and I don't think the people in the mine or that driver knew that the drone I was flying was a Chinese drone, but that truck is size of a three or four story house. So he was probably listening to Sino Pop and like rocking out as he was driving his oh, wow. 200, tu so 200 ton truck. So that's a long lens. <laughs> no, it's a wide angle, but I was like right on top of him. I was following the, I was following the truck. Oh, but wow. um, you know, it's funny, I mean, being in a Jesuit university, I work on the Jesuit principle that it's a lot easier to get forgiveness than it is to get permission. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> And um, it was in, in I, I was in China for another uh, another project, and I ended up sitting at a dinner with somebody who worked for the Chinese coal industry, and I was kind of sniffing around because I knew about I'd already scouted this mine, I knew where it was, I knew it was the biggest, I knew mm -hmm. where I wanted to go, and I was trying to see if I could find a way to get in, like you know, legitimately. Mm -hmm. And they were not willing to even talk about what you know their their coal production. So I realized it was going to have to do with the. Um, uh, the Jesuit way. <laughs> and I found uh, a driver who had a, had a local beat up car that was it had local plates. And it had, it was very Chinese, it had darkened windows and everything except the front windshield. And he put me in the back of the, the, the long nose in the back of the truck. Uh -huh. With my, my son was with my 17 year old son. And um, we, he, they took it, he took us to the mine and we got to some checkpoints. He just said we were trying to get to the local village which had been kind of surrounded by the mine. 
because the mine just keeps on eating more and more mm -hmm. soil. So they took us to the edge of the pit, and it was actually where they have their explosives depot. And uh, we flew from the parking lot of the explosive depot because it was the day off for the explosive people. And um, I would flew for like three hours, and I was just very, I was very glad when we got out of there with my memory cards. Um, and uh, but it's just you, you. There were a number of things like that in China that we, flew. even the, the picture of um, uh, of Shanghai, um, I got. Uh, arrested or detained when I was trying to take a picture like this from the street and so I found an, a building wow. that was uh, had a scenic overlook and they let me uh, so, go so up the there and I flew from the building. I didn't want you taking a picture from the street. I mean, what's the complaint? That's like, oh, I'm taking a picture well, the, of this incredible cityscape. Well, I knew about the Nanfu Bridge. I wanted for I went to the I was trying to take off from the street with my drone and they ah. and they snagged me. And so I, I said, oh, sorry, sorry, I didn't know, and I went away. And then I went to a, went up the elevator of a, to a tall building, and I, I paid for money to take pictures, supposedly, with the cam with a regular camera. And they left, they were bored, and they left me up there with my case, pulled out the drone, and flew for about an hour and a half at sunset. So you had to find, you had to find a, a, a little way. And even in, in Mauritania, in West Africa, Mauritania is um, it's a military dictatorship. And you, I showed up with my drones, and. Um, I had to do, I had to fix, I had to do some fancy talking to get me through customs. Mm -hmm. And I came to a really obscure airport where they only had a custom guy showed up for two hours, like twice a week, so he just kind of wanted to go home. Hmm. And uh, you had to find a, a little way. I, I've, been, I've been doing aerial photography for a long time, in, uh, especially in the Middle East, and I, you have to find oh. a, a little kind of chink in the armor to get through. Because I would think that um, it would be easy for some customs official or security official to look at a drone and accuse you of being a spy. Sure. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a big issue. And even in Mauritania, I was there working on um, something else besides climate change, and I had to take pictures of my drone in the approach to the international runway. And so I would go to the airport in the morning and ask when their next plane was coming in. They said, oh, nothing for two hours. So I'd do a fly my drone and then get it down before the planes came in, because it was right in the approach pattern. Mm -hmm. But you have, to, you have to find a little way. I mean, it's common in journalism. You just have to get, it's all about access, you know? I know you're from New Jersey. You're not the guy who shut down Newark Airport yesterday with your drones. <laughs> no, I was not. I mean, actually, yeah, I think that's a bogus story because that drone, they said it was flying at 300,000 feet, and drones can't fly that high. So I think somebody at the FAA saw a bird in the radar and put out the wrong information. <laughs> 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 Giving drone, drone photographers a bad name. Yeah, they, they can't do that. Um, what about uh, the California wildfires? It's hard mm -hmm. to capture human suffering, people's faces, all those pictures that really move us are the ones of people whose teddy bears are scattered in the, you know, what was their garden and who all their, you know, belongings of this world, all their worldly belongings have been destroyed and you see their faces. Those are the pictures that really get us. So how did you deal with the California wildfires as a, as a story? Well, for the fire, um I was actually in New York when the fires hit, and there was a, a picture in the front page of the New York Times, and I got a call from my editor saying I had to get to California PDQ. For this project, yeah. for Losing Earth, yeah. for the New York yeah. Times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I, I said, okay, and I, I, I got on a plane that afternoon, and I had a helicopter waiting for me in Oakland, and I got on the helicopter an hour before sunrise, and we flew up to the fire area. And with the, with the helicopter, you can get into controlled airspace. It would be illegal to do that with a drone. You can fly actually closer with the helicopter than with the drone? Well, you can, they, in a disaster, they usually, they will block out the airspace. Okay. And, and, and you have to have radio contact with the tower to make sure you're not gonna run into people trying to put out the fires. And it's, they're closed off to drones. Mm -hmm. And so I started with the, uh, with the helicopter, and then it turned out the coffee park, which was really hammered, was actually just outside of the exclusion zone. So after I did the helicopter flight, I went back with the drone. But what's most moving, as you point out, was, was actually seeing it on the ground. And like seeing this uh, this car with like melted aluminum hubs, mm -hmm. people had to get out so quickly. They had to, they took one car, they'd leave their car behind, and it, it was really wild. If you look at this um, picture of the this neighborhood, it's um, it's really quite extraordinary because the the trees are only burned at the top. It was the there mm -hmm. was, the winds were so strong, it just it was it was a ground fire, and the, the trees actually they, they might live because the tops are okay, it, but it was just super intense ground fire because of these strong winds and all the all the dry grass. It was really a, not a typical fire. So this you took from the ground, not from the air. Yeah, one of the wonderful things about, drown, about drones is you, you're, you don't have much range, and so you gotta be there. Mm -hmm. And so I actually was flying my drone in, in the neighborhood after I, got, I did the helicopter thing, and then I went back with the drone. And then my, one of my drones went commando, and it took off and, and just crashed. It threw a propeller, and it had a catastrophic crash. So I went to see the FedEx, to ship it out FedEx for repair, and the FedEx guy lived in that air, area, and he was telling me how he got out that night, and mm -hmm. his own personal story, and it was really, it was extremely moving. 
One of the things that's striking about these pictures to me is that although in the Bangladesh photos, for example, you do see little people and you see, you know, you see them scattering and being forced to move, your pictures are all about the big picture and they're not about, you know, the human scale of one person crying or one person having lost their child or their dog or whatever. Um, how do you feel about telling the stories when you're telling it on that kind of a macro scale? Do you feel you're still able to have the same emotional impact and get the same message across? Well, and what I was trying to do was to show the, the scope of the problem. So when you see something like this, I mean, to me, I look at that, I can see it's a, you know, a cul-de-sac, you know, a suburban neighborhood. I can, to me, when I look at that, I'm a Californian, and I look at that and it's like, oof. That's, I look at that, it's personal to me. Mm -hmm. and, and you see how, and you, and you see it's it, it destruction as far as you can, as, as, as far as you, into the horizon practically. But to me, it's very relatable. And so I, one of the things I, I've been doing for the past 15 years is taking kind of um, more intimate aerial photographs where you're low. It's not like looking down at a piece of carpet. Mm -hmm. It's more, you see the, I see the world more three-dimensionally, even like, um, like, like here, you can see, you know, I can relate to that pool. It's a kiddie pool. I can relate to that. And I can see all the plastic hoo-ha floating in your backyard. But it's like, oof, that, you see how big that is. And it's like, oof, that's a lot of people got hurt. This is not an isolated event that you can ignore. Mm -hmm. And so I try to take pictures where you, there's something human that you can relate to, not necessarily a teddy bear, but something that's relatable. And then you look at the expanse of it and you say, holy shit. Um, Evan, I want to go back to something that you kind of flicked at when you talked about um, resources and, and what causes conflict. And I really do think that um, so much of the conflict in the last 10, 20, maybe even 30 years has been over natural resources and, you know, limited water, um, you know, limited natural resources in general. Um, and, and we do tend to just classify it as, oh, that's ethnic conflict or that's whatever it is without thinking about, well, actually people are fighting over who has the control of the water, who has the control over necessary uh, resources. So Mauritania is one example where I think of that, you know, the desertification causing social strife that can lead to larger conflicts. So when you, when you sort of think about it from that lens, um, what are your concerns about the conflicts that we see around the world and whether those, some of those can be addressed by addressing natural resources? Yeah, so I think some of those conflicts fit into a category of environmental impacts and say uh, diminishing access to freshwater resources for growing food. That communities impacted by that um, begin to organize and antagonize each other to, to, to get in-group privilege access. There's another set of issues related to access to fossil fuel money. So you look at countries like Iraq, uh, Venezuela now, um, you could also include places like Ecuador or Nigeria in this conversation, where there are certain parts of the country that are able to enjoy um, a really high level of livelihood because the money from fossil fuels is benefiting people locally. And the people in the same country are not given even access to that amount of money. And those are some of the most unst uh, unstable places in the planet, right? Because this, this have and have not around uh, fossil fuels is, is a real driver of conflict. We tend to think about those as political conflicts or civil wars, but they have this important environmental dimension isn't you shouldn't there, forget. Isn't there a climatological dimension in Syria as well? Tell us about that. So, so I, I reference this really briefly, but um, in the three or four years leading up to the Arab Spring, uh, there were a series of um, historically poor agricultural yields, right? There was a drought, uh, and a lot of people believe um, there's, there's good social scientific evidence that suggests that the, the Arab Spring itself, but particularly the reason why the Arab Spring um, translated into a violent and ongoing um, civil war in Syria and not elsewhere is because of this um, regional or sub-regional uh, drought issue. So a lot of this has to do with um, a state that was never a strong institution and was never a particularly um, well known for its deliverance of goods to marginalized communities and in fact kind of held together by pitting communities against each other. And then with the shock of the 2008 to 2013 drought in Syria, that um, 
those tensions sort of came to a boil. So it's the, the, the tensions themselves are politically and socially constructed, but the, they're ignited and exacerbated by mounting environmental pressures. And I think we're likely to see much more of that in a world that's, that's warming over the coming years. All right, I want to open it up to all of you um, in the audience here to you know, have a conversation with Evan and George and take this opportunity. So we have a couple of microphones that will come around and let me ask you to please identify yourself and any affiliation you have and please try to um, make sure it's a question and, uh, and not just a statement. Um, this is the first hand I saw go up right here. Hi, uh, you're not going to make me stand, are you? <clears throat> so my name's Greg Drury. I'm with Wholeness, W-H-O-L-E-N-E-S-S, -S, a nonprofit um, that started 27 years ago. Um, and I love the uh, religious context you're bringing this into because there's a number of things that were sort of mentioned but not <clears throat> directly, which is contradiction and paradox in some ways is spiritual. If you can embrace those things, which a lot of what you're talking about is, <clears throat> also, um, wealth versus material, I mean, materialism versus spirituality. The materialism drives, you know, people ignoring the climate to generate more money. And also human frailty, and that is the inability to give up that materialism. Like my neighbor gets UPS deliveries three times a day, and he's in a pretty good demographic. <clears throat> so my point is, with our uh, evolving society and the growth in consciousness. Do you find, do you see a tipping point occurring where uh, people will start living more simply? And um, I saw a montage of a number of uh, sustainability successes. So when we get to that point where we can give up that materialism and live on a high spirit, more spiritual realm, which is what you know godliness is about. Um, do you see us ever reaching that with our you know, I mean, in the last hundred years, we've gone from industrial revolution to like pushing a button to get whatever we want. So this is continually. So, so my question is, do you see the tipping point ever occurring where we will be able to live a more simple lifestyle, but sustainable and maybe more, you know, even successful because this, we're not basing it. This is a question them. for Evan. It's for both. For yeah, both. For both. Okay. I mean, legit question. I, I could give up meat, but I'm not sure I could give up delivery of everything so I don't have to go to shops anymore. <laughs> so, there, you know. uh, not to get into the, the micro politics of this, but there's some evidence to suggest that having goods delivered to you is less environmentally impactful than driving to the store yourself. Dang. So you, your, uh, <laughs> your indulgences have been bought. Um, no, I think it's really clear that if we're going to come up with a robust cultural response to climate change, there needs to be a spiritual dimension to that. We also, I don't think I have a prognostication about that, but it's clearly up to us about whether we can develop those kinds of cultural and spiritual responses or whether we want to let environmental pressures answer those challenges for us. George, any thoughts? Well, as any Texan will tell you, if you want to get out of a hole, first thing you do is got to stop digging. And I think, you know, we've all, we've got to all start uh, consuming less. Whether well, there's a tipping point, I mean, the scientists will tell you that there's, you know, a possibility that let's say the, the, the certain ocean currents could all of a sudden just flip. And I don't know that there, I don't know if we're, there is, and I don't know if that's true. I don't think anybody really knows there, there were suppositions. Um, but it seems like we're in this fake news era where people can mold whatever reality they want to, to, to their, their existing belief systems. And so I don't really know if the, if, if the if the if the current started to flip, they might say they really come up with a different reason to keep doing what they're doing. But I think we all have to stop digging. Well, you always hear the argument like, "Oh, this is so cold. Who says there's global warming?" So the sort of lack of understanding of the difference between weather and climate. Um, but on that question of the tipping point, we actually, the Pulitzer Center sponsored another um, journalist named Sam Eaton who did some fantastic work for PBS NewsHour and Public Radio International on the Amazon reaching a tipping point at which it's giving out more carbon than it is absorbing it through the trees because of um, clear cutting and other, and other things. Um, yes, the lady right here. Hi. Can you wait for the microphone to come to you? Thanks. Hello, I'm Sister Mary Johnson. I'm on the faculty at Trinity Washington University here in DC. I'm a sociologist and I use 
Pope Francis's Laudato Si in several of my courses, and it's very well received. The students um, engage with it in a very powerful way. I'm wondering, from your perspective, have you seen positive outcomes from that encyclical? And do you see any possibilities for its use more widely? Interesting question. Yeah. Evan, you want to start? Uh, I also use Laudato Si in my teaching. I love it. It's, a, it's an, an amazing text. Uh, and one of the things I like most about it is that it's often uh, that my Catholic students are sort of lukewarm about it, uh, and my secular students are the ones who are really gung-ho, which I think raises interesting questions about who's listening and what kinds of moral messages are being constructed there. Um, I would say two things about Laudato Si. I think the Paris Agreement is probably a little stronger than it might otherwise have been were it not for the Vatican's very smart yeah. diplomatic rollout of that document. And I also think that at least in certain orders, uh, the Catholic Church is uh, increasingly using Laudato in their educational infrastructure and, and thinking about it as a teaching doctor, uh, uh, document at the parish level, in, their, in various universities and colleges and, and high schools around the world. So I think um, its full potential as um, an impactful document is yet to be realized, but I think it's going to be with us for, for years to come. The lady back here in the pink. Hi, my name is Julia Watts-Belser. I'm a professor here at Georgetown. And I'm interested particularly in the affective dimension of climate change, how climate makes us feel, um, and whether religion might help us grapple with some of these things, some of these feelings, fear, grief, shame, anxiety, guilt, that seem to me to be also really connected to some of the reasons why well-intentioned folks don't really grapple full on with the climate. Do you think there's a place for religion in working that angle? Thank you. Yeah. Um, have you seen uh, Sarah Frederick's forthcoming book? I would imagine you've probably shared it back and forth with her. I think that's going to be. What's it called for um, the people who don't know? I don't. So Sarah Frederick is a professor at the University of Chicago. I can't remember the title of her book, but it's about. Um, online communities and the kinds of places where people are sharing information about sort of guilt stories around climate change. So there's this whole narr set of narratives around sort of, I feel bad about flying or eating meat, and like, I'm struggling to give it up, what should I do? So there's these um, penitent communities that are figuring out how to grapple with environmental sin. Those are some deep subreddits. <laughs> haven't hit those yet, okay. <laughs> um, well, if you ever are looking for a stimulating read, uh, they're, they're to be found. Um, so yeah, I do think that maybe the way to think about it is that uh, a lot of that stuff just happens in popular culture. And I think the resources of religion and religious thought maybe can allow a little bit more depth and sophistication. I think we're all getting pushed to that. We're all getting pushed into hotter and colder extremes. We're all being forced to see increasing levels of environmental brutality on, on the TV news. And I think we're going to be requ required to come up with good responses. So we're being pushed to that. I don't, I don't necessarily know how it'll play out. But it's this, this question about our spiritual responses is clearly a real piece. Did you want to add anything, George? No, I'm all right. OK. Um, are there any students or interns in the room, since we are at a university, who would like to ask a question? I don't want them to be drowned out by all the brilliant professors. No students? Who want to ask a question? OK. Who else? All right. Um, I see this, uh, this gentleman here in the front row. Uh, I'm Robert Joseph. I'm a retired lawyer. And I guess I have a question. Uh, to what extent is the problem of galvanizing a public reaction a, a function of people who just discount the future substantially? In other words, they, they just say, that's far away, I'm here. And it is also discounted by reason of the fact they're not immediately affected. There are a lot of people immediately affected, but they're not immediately okay. affected. And I'm trying to figure out how religion deals with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could take an eschatological view, you know, the end is coming, so live, live now, mm -hmm. the end is coming. You could take an incarnational view that we're here and we're here to protect what God has given us. And so I'm not sure how we're, I mean, I have my own view. I, you know, I'm a Catholic. I, I take a, a, in, a more incarnational uh, uh, view and, and a more um, solidarity view. I'm not saying I lived by it the way I should. Anyway, those are my questions. 
Evan. Yeah, the President George W. Bush once said when asked if he agreed about some future scenario about the impacts of climate change that he didn't really know because he would be dead by the time that happened, which I thought was a particularly presidential remark. Um, <laughs> So yeah, there is a, a struggle around how, how to know about that and to experience that. I think it, it actually relates a lot to what Indira was saying about the difference between climate and weather. To be able to think in terms of patterns and broader scale uh, sets of activity than just sort of my immediate environment. So I think one thing that's happening is that it's getting increasingly impossible for anyone to know, to, to live a life even in the United States, where you don't know people who are directly impacted by climate change. It, just each year we go forward, everyone's gonna have a relative who uh, spent all summer keeping their infant child away from the smoke in the Bay Area last summer. Or everyone's gonna know someone who was displaced for six months from their condo in Houston. Just more and more people will see that. But the key that. is people making the connection between that and climate. Um, you know, I lived through Hurricane Irma in South Florida, and plenty of people saw it as just another bad hurricane and didn't experience it as something that climate was causing. Yeah. So uh, there is a disconnect in the, uh, you know, among many people in the public. I, I and that's where I go back yeah. to my question about, and maybe George, you have some thoughts on this, on what kind of journalism can be produced yeah. that makes that connection real for people. Um, I think you have to make it, people re realize their own culpability, and, and that, that's a tricky thing to do. No I don't, one likes that. Yeah, and I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of like, you know, if you're on a diet and you realize that you really want to have that thing, and, and, and you, know, you don't want to think about the long-term effects of that. You know that, like, it's not good for your heart and all these other things, but you, you say, geez, that really looks really good. And I, I don't know how to, with climate, it's, it's a very tricky thing to do. Uh, um, I think people look at these pictures and say, wow, that's like a really big problem, but I don't think they, I, I I don't, to be honest, I don't know if that makes them think like, what can I personally do? Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. um, I did actually see a student's hand go up right here, um, just as I called on this gentleman. Hi, my name is Alana. I'm a recent Georgetown grad and also interning with the Pulitzer Center currently. My question was about Evan, your, um, you spoke a little bit about how kind of because climate change has become so politically charged in the United States, a lot more coverage has been on kind of the religious right and their views on climate change or lack thereof. And I'm wondering if you think it's more the journalists not reaching the religious left, so to speak, or if it's a matter of kind of organization on the religious, you know, on, on um, people who are involved with religion who are activists for climate change and stuff like that, if you think it, it's more, you know, what's the uh, missing link there in terms of those stories not being covered or that, you know, not being communicated? Yeah, it's a great question, thank you. Um, I think we're sort of having two parallel conversations here. One of the conversations is about what kinds of journalistic coverage do we need to, to build a more robust, um, public awareness about climate change so that we can actually do something about it. And that, I, I think for the most part, um, the professional journalists I know are doing a great job with that. Uh, we have, we haven't, one thing we haven't even talked about yet is the, the protests around Standing Rock in 2016 and the, the, the much overdue uh, treatment of Native American perspectives on uh, environmental justice in our country. Right? That's a really important development and it got a lot of great coverage. Um, the Pope's visit to the United States in the fall of 2015 when he spoke on the steps of Congress about climate change. I mean, we've, we've seen this stuff reach national levels of awareness. So part of it is not just about what journalists can be doing, but about the fractured landscape of the, 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 of the media in the United States that you could quite easily um, choose which coverage of the Pope's speech on climate change on the steps to watch. And essentially what you're getting is editorialization either way. Um, so my question is, this is a place where I don't know what to do about that. I think journalists are telling good stories, uh, but I, I don't know what we do around the, the social media dimension of that, where you don't get a holistic, nuanced view in all communities. Well, a good example of that is just this Rashomon experience 
in the last couple of days over the, the young men in the MAGA hats from the Catholic high school in Kentucky and their interaction with this Native American elder and seen from all different points of view and mediated through all different news organizations or Twitter influencers, there are completely different stories being told about what happened. Um, and I think the same is true, as you say, of you know covering climate change. Different stories are being told about the same thing. We even saw with President Trump's comments about climate change just in the last month or so. He basically said, you know, it's not a thing. Um, so, yeah, Sean. Um, and uh, sorry, can I just also before Sean goes, can I see if there are any other hands of last questions? All right, I'm going to take three as the final round. Sean, go ahead first. George, I'd love to hear the analysis of, of the Sunday Times Magazine. Was that viewed as a success, a failure? What was the internal evaluation of that particular uh, format and project? Okay, well, uh, good. Uh, sorry, let's just, I'm going to take three questions together. Yes, sir, you right here. Question of whether... Oh, sorry, could you identify yourself oh, when the mic comes? Andrew Trotter, member of the community and okay. uh, a church that has an environmental... Uh, initiative. I'm wondering whether political and economic inequities in the United States, especially, um, worsen these uh, other the, the the awareness and the action on political uh, on on climate change. And this it's kind of like the frog in the warming the mm -hmm. water over the the flame. The boiling frog. Uh, but mm -hmm. when the people in the uh, who are often receiving the worst of it are the most disenfranchised uh, folks in the, in the country. Okay, great. And one last question. I'm sorry, we are going to have to end on time. I see a lady back there. Thank you. Jean Duff with the Joint Learning Initiative on Faith and Local Communities, taking us back to the second conversation about religious influence, if you please. And uh, remembering that, I think it was last week, that the Lancet issued a fascinating report uh, from the EAT Lancet Commission on healthy diet and sustainable consequences, modeling um, the, uh, the, the possibilities of uh, impact of, of a healthy diet on sustainable environmentalism. It got me thinking about the Adventists and their mortality um, uh, lift uh, from their vegetarian diet, the faith-inspired vegetarian diet. And I wonder if I could ask um, Professor Berry for some other examples of positive faith influence uh, on climate. Okay, so we have first for George a question about whether the New York Times saw losing Earth as a success um, or failure or why and why. Um, I think they, the Times, I think they felt that it was a resigned success. They felt they needed to kind of bust through the, the, the clutter and make a really strong statement. Even like having, I mean, the symbology of having a black cover magazine with very fine print is like they're not, there's no, you know, no celebrity there. It was like, it was like it, this is serious. And, uh, and having an entire issue devoted to one article, it was almost a book-length article. My wife spent like six hours you know, reading it. It was really long. She's and, a fast reader then. Yeah, <laughs> um, but it just like, they wanted to make a, a, a statement like this is serious. A and I think it did have uh, uh, impact as to whether it got to, you know, through to people in, in the red states, I, I don't know. Um, I think one of the problems we have in our culture right now is everybody's kind of preaching to the choir. We're using a curriculum based on losing Earth that, that the Pulitzer Center has developed that is being used in classrooms and in universities. So we're doing outreach still based on this project that we sponsored. All right, the second question was about whether we're the frog being boiled and not even realizing it, and whether political and economic inequities in this country are actually making it harder for people to perceive um, the impact that climate is having. Yes. All right. <laughs> We're being boiled, no doubt. Uh, all right. And the last question was from Jean about um, she made reference to the Lancet and the healthy diet. And can you give some other um, examples of what we could be doing, how religion can have um, a positive impact on our sustainability in general? 
Sure, I'll actually um, point to a project that emerged out of the partnership between the American University and the Pulitzer Center. Uh, Bill Gentile, a colleague of mine in the School of Communications, along with a student, produced a short film about the work that the Catholic Relief Services is doing in Colombia. So one particular thing that's happening as the, um, as the planet warms is that certain kinds of crops get harder to grow in the places where they are. So coffee in particular has to be grown in the mountains and the temperature zone on mountains where coffee grows best is moving up slope. Mm -hmm. And so people own one piece of land and they can't move the land. So how farmers adapt to that change is a really pressing problem that's moving at about a meter uphill per year which is fast, fast. really fast, really right? Fast. So that short documentary explores some of the work um, that they've done in trying to help farmers think about coffee varietals, about distribution models, about shifting to agricultural crops, about diversifying, and the series of clinics that they've put on for people. Uh, in that the American University has put on? No, the, the Catholic Relief Service. Oh, Catholic the, Relief the short Service. film is okay. about the work the Catholic Relief Service is doing, right? So there's all sorts of great examples of faith-based organizations helping communities to navigate these environmental changes, and I think that's a really positive contribution. Fascinating. All right. Well, I want to please join me in thanking Evan Thank and George for Thank discussing you for this with us. Thank you. And I want to invite all of you to reception that we're hosting in the next room. So we'll.